The Indo-Pakistani War of 1971 was the direct military confrontation between India and Pakistan during the Bangladesh Liberation War in 1971. Indian, Bangladeshi and international sources consider the beginning of the war to have been Operation Chengiz Khan, when Pakistan launched preemptive air strikes on 11 Indian air bases on 3 December 1971, leading to India's entry into the War of Independence in East Pakistan on the side of Bangladeshi nationalist forces and the commencement of hostilities with West Pakistan. Lasting just 13 days, it is considered to be one of the shortest wars in history. During the course of the war, Indian and Pakistani forces clashed on the eastern and western fronts. The war effectively came to an end after the eastern command of the Pakistani armed forces signed the Instrument of Surrender, on 16 December 1971 in Dhaka, marking the liberation of the new nation of Bangladesh. East Pakistan had officially seceded from Pakistan on 26 March 1971. Between 90,000 and 93,000 members of the Pakistan armed forces including paramilitary personnel were taken as prisoners of war by the Indian Army. It is estimated that between 300,000 and 3 million civilians were killed in Bangladesh. As a result of the conflict, a further 8 to 10 million people fled the country at the time to seek refuge in neighboring India. Background The Indo-Pakistani conflict was sparked by the Bangladesh Liberation War, a conflict between the traditionally dominant West Pakistanis and the majority East Pakistanis. The Bangladesh Liberation War ignited after the 1970 Pakistani election, in which the East Pakistani Awami League won 167 of 169 seats from East Pakistan and thus secured an absolute majority in the 313-seat lower house of the Majlis e Shura. Awami League leader Sheikh Mujibur Rahman presented the six points to the President of Pakistan and claimed the right to form the government. After the leader of the Pakistan People's Party, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, refused to yield the premiership of Pakistan to Mujibur, President Yahya Khan called the military, dominated by West Pakistanis, to suppress dissent in East Pakistan. Mass arrests of dissidents began, and attempts were made to disarm East Pakistani soldiers and police. After several days of strikes and non-cooperation movements, the Pakistani military cracked down on Dhaka on the night of 25 March 1971. The Awami League was banished, and many members fled into exile in India. Mujib was arrested on the night of 25-26 March 1971 at about 1.30 a.m. and taken to West Pakistan. The next action carried out was Operation Searchlight, an attempt to kill the intellectual elite of the East. On 26 March 1971, Zia Rahman, a major in the Pakistani army, declared the independence of Bangladesh. In April, exiled Awami League leaders formed a government in exile in Badianath Taylor of Mehapa. The East Pakistan Rifles, a paramilitary force, defected to the rebellion. Bangladesh force namely Mukti Bahini consisting of Niamhita Bahini and Gono Bahini was formed under the Commander-in-Chief General Muhammad Atal. Ghani Osmani, India's involvement in Bangladesh Liberation War the Pakistan army conducted a widespread genocide against the Bengali population of East Pakistan, aimed in particular at the minority Hindu population, leading to approximately 10 million people fleeing East Pakistan and taking refuge in the neighboring Indian states. The East Pakistan-India border was opened to allow refugees safe shelter in India. The governments of West Bengal, Bihar, Assam, Meghalaya and Tripura established refugee camps along the border. The resulting flood of impoverished East Pakistani refugees placed an intolerable strain on India's already overburdened economy. General Tikka Khan earned the nickname Butcher of Bengal because of the widespread atrocities he committed. 
He was previously known as the Butcher of Balochistan. For other infamous atrocities he had committed, General Niazi commenting on his actions noted, On the night between 25-26 March 1971 General Ticker struck. Peaceful night was turned into a time of wailing, crying and burning. General Ticker let loose everything at his disposal as if raiding an enemy, not dealing with his own misguided and misled people. The military action was a display of stark cruelty more merciless than the massacres at Bukhara and Baghdad by Cheng Is Khan and Halaku Khan. General Ticker resorted to the killing of civilians and a scorched earth policy. His orders to his troops were, I want the land not the people, Major General Farman had written in his table diary, Greenland of East Pakistan will be painted red. It was painted red by Bengali blood. The Indian government repeatedly appealed to the international community, but failing to elicit any response. Prime Minister Indira Gandhi on 27 March 1971 expressed full support of her government for the independence struggle of the people of East Pakistan. The Indian leadership under Prime Minister Gandhi quickly decided that it was more effective to end the genocide by taking armed action against Pakistan than to simply give refuge to those who made it across to refugee camps. Exiled East Pakistan army officers and members of the Indian intelligence immediately started using these camps for recruitment and training of Mukti, Bahini guerrillas. The mood in West Pakistan had also turned increasingly jingoistic and militaristic against East Pakistan and India. By the end of September, an organized propaganda campaign, possibly orchestrated by elements within the government of Pakistan, resulted in stickers proclaiming Crush India becoming a standard feature on the rear windows of vehicles in rural Pindi. Islamabad in Lahore and soon spread to the rest of West Pakistan. By October, other stickers proclaimed Hang the Traitor in an apparent reference to Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. India's official engagement with Pakistan, objective by November, war seemed inevitable. Throughout November, thousands of people led by West Pakistani politicians marched in Lahore and across West Pakistan calling for Pakistan to crush India. India responded by starting a massive build-up of Indian forces on the borders. The Indian military waited until December, when the drier ground would make for easier operations and Himalayan passes would be closed by snow, preventing any Chinese intervention. On 23 November, Yahya Khan declared a state of emergency in all of Pakistan and told his people to prepare for war. On the evening of 3 December Sunday, at about 5.40 p.m., the Pakistani Air Force launched a preemptive strike on 11 airfields in northwestern India, including Agra, which was 300 miles from the border. At the time of this attack, the Taj Mahal was camouflaged with a forest of twigs and leaves and draped with burlap because its marble glowed like a white beacon in the moonlight. This preemptive strike known as Operation Cheng Is Khan was inspired by the success of Israeli Operation Focus in the Arab-Israeli Six-Day War. But, unlike the Israeli attack on Arab air bases in 1967 which involved a large number of Israeli planes, Pakistan flew no more than 50 planes to India. In an address to the nation on radio that same evening, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi held that the airstrikes were a declaration of war against India and the Indian Air Force responded with initial air strikes that very night. These airstrikes were expanded to massive retaliatory airstrikes the next morning. This marked the official start of the Indo-Pakistani War of 1971. Prime Minister Indira Gandhi ordered the immediate mobilization of troops and launched a full-scale invasion. This involved Indian forces in a massive coordinated air, sea, and land assault. The main Indian objective on the Eastern Front was to capture Dhaka and on the Western Front was to prevent Pakistan from entering Indian soil. There was no Indian intention of conducting any major offensive into West Pakistan. Naval hostilities Naval reconnaissance submarine operations were started by the Pakistan Navy on both Eastern and Western Front. 
in the Western Theatre of the War, the Indian Navy, under the command of Vice Admiral S. N. Kohli, successfully attacked Karachi's port in Operation Trident on the night of 4-5 December, using missile boats, sinking Pakistani destroyer PNS Khyber and minesweeper PNS Mahafiz. PNS Shah Jahan was also badly damaged. In response, Pakistani submarines sought out major Indian warships. 720 Pakistani sailors were killed or wounded, and Pakistan lost reserve fuel and many commercial ships, thus crippling the Pakistan Navy's further involvement in the conflict. Operation Trident was followed by Operation Python on the night of 8-9 December, in which Indian missile boats attacked the Karachi port resulting in further destruction of reserve fuel tanks and the sinking of three Pakistani merchant ships. In the eastern theatre of the war, the Indian Eastern Naval Command, under Vice Admiral Krishnan, completely isolated East Pakistan by a naval blockade in the Bay of Bengal, trapping the Eastern Pakistani Navy and eight foreign merchant ships in their ports. From 4 December onwards, the aircraft carrier INS Vikrant was deployed, and its Seahawk fighter bombers attacked many coastal towns in East Pakistan including Chittagong and Cox's Bizar. Pakistan countered the threat by sending the submarine PNS Ghazi, which sank en route under mysterious circumstances off Vizakapatnam's coast reducing Pakistan's control of Bangladeshi coastline. But on 9 December, the Indian Navy suffered its biggest wartime loss when the Pakistani submarine PNS Hangul sank the frigate in Kukri in the Arabian Sea resulting in a loss of 18 officers and 176 sailors. The damage inflicted on the Pakistani Navy stood at seven gunboats, one minesweeper, one submarine, two destroyers. Three patrol crafts belonging to the Coast Guard, 18 cargo, supply and communication vessels, and large-scale damage inflicted on the naval base and docks in the coastal town of Karachi. Three merchant navy ships, Anwar Baksh, Pasni and Madhumathi, and ten smaller vessels were captured. Around 1,900 personnel were lost, while 1413 servicemen were captured by Indian forces in Dhaka. According to one Pakistan scholar, Tariq Ali, the Pakistan Navy lost a third of its force in the war. Air operations after the initial preemptive strike, PAF adopted a defensive stance in response to the Indian retaliation. As the war progressed, the Indian Air Force continued to battle the PAF over conflict zones. But the number of sorties flown by the PAF gradually decreased day by day. The Indian Air Force flew 4,000 sorties while its counterpart, the PAF, offered little in retaliation, partly because of the paucity of non-Bengali technical personnel. This lack of retaliation has also been attributed to the deliberate decision of the PAF High Command to cut its losses as it had already incurred huge losses in the conflict. Though the PAF did not intervene during the Indian Navy's raid on Pakistani naval port city of Karachi, it retaliated by bombing the Oka Harbour, destroying the fuel tanks used by the boats that had attacked. In the east, the small air contingent of Pakistan Air Force No. 14 Squadron was destroyed, putting the Dhaka airfield out of commission and resulting in Indian air superiority in the east. Attacks on Pakistan while India's grip on what had been East Pakistan tightened, the IAF continued to press home attacks against Pakistan itself. The campaign developed into a series of daylight anti-airfield, anti-radar and close support attacks by fighters, with night attacks against airfields and strategic targets by B-57S and C-130, and Canberra's and N-12s. The PAF's F-6S were employed mainly on defensive combat air patrols over their own bases. 
but without air superiority the PAF was unable to conduct effective offensive operations, and its attacks were largely ineffective. During the IAF's airfield attacks, one U.S. and one U.N. aircraft were damaged in Dhaka, while a Canadian Air Force caribou was destroyed at Islamabad. Along with U.S. military liaison chief Brigadier General Chuck Yeager's USAF Beach U-8 light twin, Sporadic raids by the IAF continued against Pakistan's forward air bases in the West until the end of the war, and large-scale interdiction and close support operations, and were maintained. The PAF played a more limited part in the operations, and were reinforced by F-104S from Jordan, Mirages from an unidentified Middle Eastern ally and by F-86S from Saudi Arabia. Their arrival helped camouflage the extent of Pakistan's losses. Libyan F-5S were reportedly deployed to Sargodar perhaps as a potential training unit to prepare Pakistani pilots for an influx of more F-5S from Saudi Arabia. The IAF was able to conduct a wide range of missions, troop support, air combat, deep penetration strikes, para dropping behind enemy lines, feints, to draw enemy fighters away from the actual target, bombing, and reconnaissance. In contrast, the Pakistan Air Force, which was solely focused on air combat, was blown out of the subcontinent's skies within the first week of the war. Those PAF aircraft that survived took refuge at Iranian air bases or in concrete bunkers, refusing to offer a fight. Hostilities officially ended at 14.30 GMT on 17 December, after the fall of Dhaka on 15 December. India claimed large gains of territory in West Pakistan, and the independence of Pakistan's east wing as Bangladesh was confirmed. India flew 1,978 sorties in the east and about 4,000 in the west, while the PAF flew about 30 in 2,840. More than 80% of the IAF's sorties were close support and interdiction, and about 45 IAF aircraft were lost. Pakistan lost 75 aircraft, not including any F-6S Mirage IIIs, or the six Jordanian F-104S which failed to return to their donors. But the imbalance in air losses was explained by the IAF's considerably higher sortie rate, and its emphasis on ground attack missions. On the ground Pakistan suffered most, with 8,000 killed and 25,000 wounded while India lost 3,000 dead and 12,000 wounded. The loss of armored vehicles was similarly imbalanced. This represented a major defeat for Pakistan. Ground operations Pakistan attacked at several places along India's western border with Pakistan, but the Indian Army successfully held their positions. The Indian Army quickly responded to the Pakistan Army's movements in the west and made some initial gains including capturing around 5,795 square miles of Pakistan territory. On the Eastern Front, the Indian Army joined forces with the Mukti Bayani to form the Maitri Bayani, unlike the 1965 war which had emphasized set-piece battles and slow advances. This time the strategy adopted was a swift three-pronged assault of nine infantry divisions with attached armored units and close air support that rapidly converged on Dhaka, the capital of East Pakistan. Lieutenant General Jagit Singh Arora, who commanded the 8th, 23rd, and 57th Divisions, led the Indian thrust into East Pakistan. As these forces attacked Pakistani formations, the Indian Air Force rapidly destroyed the small air contingent in East Pakistan and put the Dhaka airfield out of commission. In the meantime, the Indian Navy effectively blockaded East Pakistan. The Indian campaign employed blitzkrieg techniques, exploiting weakness in the enemy's positions and bypassing opposition, and resulted in a swift victory. Faced with insurmountable losses, the Pakistani military capitulated in less than a fortnight. On 16 December, the Pakistani forces stationed in East Pakistan surrendered. 
Surrender of Pakistani forces in East Pakistan The instrument of surrender of Pakistani forces stationed in East Pakistan was signed at Ramna Race, course in Dhaka at 16.31 IST on 16 December 1971 by Lieutenant General Jagit Singh Arora, General Officer Commanding in Chief of Eastern Command of the Indian Army and Lieutenant General A. A. K. Niazi, Commander of Pakistani Forces in East Pakistan. As Arora accepted the surrender, the surrounding crowds on the race course began shouting anti-Niazi and anti-Pakistan slogans. India took approximately 90,000 prisoners of war, including Pakistani soldiers and their East Pakistani civilian supporters. 79,676 prisoners were uniformed personnel, of which 55,692 were army, 16,354 paramilitary, 5,296 police, 1,000 navy and 800 PAF. The remaining prisoners were civilians, either family members of the military personnel or collaborators. The Hamoud ur Rahman Commission report instituted by Pakistan lists the Pakistani powers as follows. Apart from soldiers, it was estimated that 15,000 Bengali civilians were also made prisoners of war.